the studios of AFN Bremerhaven. AFN Television Spotlight. With national, international, and local news and events, with reports from throughout the European Command. Good evening. I'm Specialist Jeff Titchenell. And tonight on Spotlight, we'll travel to the Greek island of Crete and the NATO missile range there. We'll also see a four-year-old wonder water skier and a man who built his very own full-sized Viking ship. Those stories and more coming up on Spotlight tonight. But first in the news headlines, President Carter is expected to stress the need to revive the economy in remarks he will make to the National Urban League later today. In his speech, he will stress the nation's economic foundations have to be rebuilt and that he will soon announce an economic renewal plan that will put people back to work. The basics of the program call for modernization of industry, lower inflation, and new facilities to conserve energy. President Carter is the fourth presidential candidate to address the Urban League meeting in New York. Ronald Reagan, Edward Kennedy, and John Anderson all spoke to the black group earlier. Meanwhile, Republican presidential hopeful Ronald Reagan was in Chicago meeting with black leaders, including the leader of Bush, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Reagan said that many Democrats might be surprised in November if they try to take the black vote for granted. Democrats, on the other hand, are making no effort to hide the battle that's sure to develop over whether to free delegates to vote for the candidate of their choice on the first ballot. Carter and Kennedy forces agreed to debate and vote on the issue in prime time during national television coverage on the first night of the convention, which is scheduled to start on Monday. The next night, Tuesday, another controversial issue will be debated, the economic planks of the party program. Officials at the Cuban Refugee Center in Pennsylvania say things are quiet now after three separate instances of rioting yesterday. Hundreds of National Guard and police were posted around the camp after about 500 Cubans threw rocks and bottles, stormed barricades, and looted the mess hall. Most of the other 5,000 refugees remained calm during the outbreak. Tonight, we continue the AFN special report on the NATO missile firing installation, or commonly referred to as NAFI. Located in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea on the island of Crete, the installation offers the perfect training grounds for the U.S. Army's 32nd Defense Command. AFN Specialist Mark Munchurin has a look at the 32nd and at NAFI. It's just one of the many air defense systems deployed by USERA's 32nd Army Air Defense Command. Headquartered in Darmstadt, 32nd ADCOM provides air defense for all of USERA. Its commander, Major General Charles Means. We're a uh, USERAR unit, it's a division size unit of about 15,000 soldiers. We're assigned to USERAR, but we are under the operational control of NATO. What that means is that uh, on our day-to-day -day mission, we perform a 24-hour mission for NATO while we're still assigned to the USERAR command. The topic of force modernization has been a subject of debate in all NATO countries in recent months. And air defense, both conventional and nuclear, has been high on the priority list. General Means sees current pluses, but is also looking to the future. There is no question in my mind that the systems we have today are effective, but they are also old systems. They represent systems that were designed and built uh, 15, 20 years ago. So they're old technology. Uh, they're very hard to maintain, and our people do an excellent job at that. But the threat continues to grow, and they continue to present increased capabilities to us. And as a result, we're embarked now in the United States Army in a whole new modernization program for air defense. What does that mean, sir? If you could wave a, a magic wand and add to your command, what would you bring in? Well, what we would bring in is what is now planned for the United States Army. And during the 1980s, we planned to bring in the Patriot Missile System, which is the next generation of high-altitude air defense systems. We plan to bring in Roland. We plan to bring in the Stinger system and to make some improvements to the systems that you've seen here today. And then finally, we will bring in a new division gun during the 1980 time frame. And it will be a complete modernization of that force. Chaparral is only one of many air defense systems that are fired at Nampi. And the United States is only one of five user nations of the range. Nampi is under the operational control of SHAPE headquarters and the Supreme Allied Commander Europe but is run on a day-to-day -day basis by the Supreme Hellenic Armed Forces Command. The range commander, Greek Major General Konstantinos Pelosis. General, how was this particular site on the island of Crete chosen to become the Nampi firing range? Well, there are three good reasons for this. Uh, first is the existence of the required area and the, uh, and the desired 
uh, orientation of that area, permitting the utilization of the maximum range of the weapons and not necessitating any removal of the population from the area. Second is the existence of the harbor and the air base near the area. And third, the good meteorological conditions which permit the operation of the Reds throughout the year. The five NATO users have been coming to Nampi ever since its official opening on the 17th of May, 1968. The range actually has three main areas, the launching and assembly areas, which are co-located on top of Whitestone Mountain. There's history on top of the mountain as well, displays of missiles old and new, and a memorial to 42 German air defense soldiers killed in a February 1975 plane crash. And down below at the base of the mountain, the cantonment area where the soldiers lived during their stay. The international makeup of the building area giving the soldiers a chance to meet their comrades from other nations. The headquarters area where control of the range, liaison among nations, and support services are full-time activities. Life is far different from a soldier's day back in Germany, and it can be a pleasant experience for the visitors, says General Pelosis. Well, uh, I could say that in addition to accomplishing of their mission, that's to say of uh, firing their missiles, it is nice to visit uh, Namfi because they will have the opportunity uh, to know something about Greece, uh, their archaeological sites, uh, the ancient Greek civilization, which, as you know, constitutes the basis of the modern Western civilization. And also, don't forget the excellent weather that, that means to enjoy the, our sunshine here. Tomorrow night, we go back to Whitestone Mountain. The missile system is called Lance. The troops are from B Battery, 2nd of the 42nd Field Artillery from Kralsheim. They call themselves the best of the best. Reporting from Crete, Specialist Mark Ventura, AFN. Spotlight will continue right after this message. Hi there. Today on the Energy Preservation Workshop, we have an item that can be made right in your very own home. Today's project is quickly becoming the fashion rage right here in Europe. It's the SES, the Static Electricity Saver. All you need is one coat, seven feet of wire, one funnel, and one of Mom's jelly jars. Now, you see, as you move, the movement creates static electricity, which is transmitted down the wires, right into the funnel and into the jar. But caution, this is a 110 power voltage only. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way, by turning off lights when not needed, avoiding the use of transformers by purchasing 110 to 220 switchable appliances, and by keeping the temperature in your home and offices to a pleasant 65 degrees. Tune in next time, and we'll show you how to make your very own solar-powered cigarette lighter. Until then, bye now. Hi, welcome into Gas House. Welcome back for another day. Say, uh, this week we're going to be doing something special for the next four days. We're going to be exploring some of the facilities and programs available for you at your Armed Forces Recreation Centers in Kimse, Garmisch, and Berchtesgarten. And I hope you'll join us for this whole series. Watch and meet somebody. This is uh, Specialist 5 John Anderson. He's from the 79th Engineer Battalion in Karlsruhe. But uh, right now, John, you're a recreation program assistant at AFRC Kimse. What do you do on an average day down there? Well, I'm a, a sailing instructor at Kimze. Our day generally starts about 8.30 in the morning, and we sail till lunchtime. And after lunch, we go back out on the lake and sail to dinner time. Had you ever sailed before you came yes, to Yes, I've been sailing since I was uh, 10 years old. Where are you from? Rhode Island. Oh, that, that figures. Okay. Mm -hmm. How is this program set up, the uh, recreation program assistant program? Okay, the, pro the recreation program assistant uh, is set up so that soldiers and airmen in Europe can be temporarily assigned to one of the three rec areas to work in the different recreation programs. Mm -hmm. What ranks does that cover? Okay, uh, to, to apply for one of these positions you must be between uh, E1 to E5. Mm -hmm. Any prerequisites as far as skills are concerned, like you have a background in sailing, did that mm -hmm. make, it, make a difference? It helps, but it's not really necessary. Probably the main thing is the desire to work at AFRC. Yeah. Does the program need women right now? Yes, we can, use, we can use women also. What are some of the various jobs, John, other than a sailing instructor, that a program assistant might find him or herself doing? We have assist, uh, program assistants involved in kayaking, windsurfing, 
mountain climbing, tennis, golf, just about every uh, facet of Now, not all of them are those glamorous jobs like uh, windsurfing and sailing. There are some, there's some jobs during the wintertime, especially, I understand, that uh, are fun to do, mm -hmm. and they provide a great service, but they're not the glamour jobs. Right. We have uh, ski patrol, for instance. Mm -hmm. Also, we have people working in the binding and fitting rooms, renting skis and things of this nature, running the chairlifts in now, the areas. What are the spin-off benefits for a guy like you? Now, you're, you're out on the lake all day teaching. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do on your off-duty time? On uh, the off-duty time, you can take uh, any of the other programs that are offered in that area, and also you can use uh, the equipment free of charge. What have you been learning this summer? Just other? about everything. Yeah. I've been hiking, um, going to do the windsurfing, possibly uh, this week. Have you tried it? You haven't tried it yet? No. I hear that too. You know, we're going to do a program later on this mm -hmm. week on windsurfing. How does one apply for duty at AFRC as a program assistant? Okay, all you have to do is either write or call. Mm -hmm. uh, the telephone number to call is Garmish Military 2535, extension mm -hmm. 601, and simply request an application. Okay, what's the address down there if somebody would like to write? The address is Recreations Operations Division, mm -hmm. Garmish, APO 09053. Okay, good enough. Is there a testing or a training period, John, once a person gets... Right. right. After you've sent your application in, it's reviewed, and if it's accepted, they'll send you orders. Mm -hmm. You report to Garmish, and you go through a two-week training and selection period. During that time, you'll get extensive Red Cross training in first aid. Oh, super. Uh, advanced first aid and CPR. In the winter time, you will learn mountain rescue techniques. In the summer, it's basically water safety, life saving, things of this nature. So there's a great personal improvement aspect yes, of this whole some thing. Very, very good training. What have you been doing in an average day? Now, I know you say you've been instructing sailing, but let's go to Kimse for an average day in the, in the life of John Anderson. <laughs> uh, like I said, average day starts about 8.30, and depending on the weather kind of uh, tells what we're going to be doing for the day. If there's no wind out, then we have film clips that we run yeah. to give the theoretical aspect of sailing. If there is wind, we go out in the water and spend the day out with the, uh, with the class. It's been a pretty crummy summer as far as the weather is concerned. Uh, it's not too bad. Yeah. It could be worse. Does that make any difference in the sailing? I no. Mean, no. No, we go out whether it's rain or shine, just as long as there's enough wind. Yeah. After this 150 days as a recreation program assistant at AFRC, what does one take back to his or her unit in the way of skills or, or anything else? In, uh, in some cases, the, uh, you have worked in uh, a supervisory capacity. You bring back a positive attitude. You can act as a focal point in your unit for to tell other people about some of the um, recreation programs in the recreation centers. Mm -hmm. Also, commanders could use that as a uh, incentive award type thing. Yeah, that's a super for a idea. troops that you know do a real good job. What has been the most gratifying thing for you this summer, uh, being a program assistant at AFRC? Well, I've got to work with a lot of different people, with the other program assistants, and meet a lot of people that come down to take the program. You know, John, a lot of our viewers have never been to Kimse or to Garmish or to Beckus Garden. Mm -hmm. uh, could you describe for us the setting down there at, at uh, Kimse? Kimse is, uh, I think, one of the um, prettiest areas I've ever been in. I've never seen a lake like that being from the coast. It's uh, surrounded just about by mountains. Yeah. It's very picturesque, and you're in a very nice area of Bavaria. There's a lot to see close by. Well, and that's true of all the areas. Hey, thanks for dropping by, and uh, we're going to continue tomorrow talking more about AFRC. Okay, thank okay. you for having me. John Anderson's been our guest. He's a Specialist 5 with the 79th Engineer Battalion in Karlsruhe. This summer, he's a Recreation Program Assistant at AFRC in Kimse. And tomorrow, we're going to go into the subject of mountaineering. I hope you'll join us as we continue to explore the facilities and programs available to you at your Armed Forces Recreation Center. I'm Herb Glover in the Goss House. Bye-bye for now. Still to come tonight on Spotlight, antique cars mean big bucks, and the flies attack Eagle, Idaho. Get in on the great escape. Break out of boredom and run for your life to the Armed Forces Recreation Centers. Jump into one of the exciting Learn Two Weeks year-round. Fill your lungs with fresh mountain air and learn to ski. Or you can limber up the old bod and make golf your new game.
Or sail away across Lake Kimse in an unforgettable learning experience. And you can soak up the sun as you learn tennis from the experts. That's right, make the great escape. Learn a new sport and you'll be a different person after only a week at Garmisch, Baptist Garden, or Kimse. It's the only way to go, so go for it. The great escape to AFRC. It's mountains of fun. Farmers in northern Germany have been using windmills for power for generations. However, now many of these windmills have been neglected because of other sources of cheap power. Now many people are finding that going back to wind power can be cheaper and more beneficial to the environment. Pat Serbakin reports from the Windy Wilds of Wisconsin. Wind power, is it a viable alternative energy source? Well, talk to Tom and Sue Peterson of Rural Prairie to Sheen, and they'll tell you it works. It helps them save money, and they feel it's helping preserve the environment. Wind generation is catching the fancy of many energy-conscious Americans. It caught the eye of Tom Peterson. His wind generator produces electricity when the wind blows between 8 and 40 miles per hour. And up here on this Mississippi River Bluff, the wind is rarely idle. Today, the wind speed is 18 miles per hour. If you notice the electrical meter, it's running backwards. Peterson says the meter often runs this way since the wind generator produces more electricity than his family can use. The extra is sent back down the line to the supplier. As a nation, we're having a lot of problems in terms of energy, in terms of environmental degradation, in terms of, of blatantly risking um, the health of future generations with nuclear power. And it seems that wind energy has to be one of the solutions. And if we're not going to put it up, who will? So somebody has to start. We're just one of the people starting. The Enertic cost just over $5,000, but with tax credit, Peterson's cost was half that at $2,700. With the savings in electrical costs, the payback period is 15 years. Peterson is excited about alternative energy, but he notes, whatever the source, it shouldn't be at the expense of the environment. And the wind, much like the sun, is there for the taking. From Prairie to Sheen, Wisconsin, this is Beth Zerbachin reporting for ABC News. Not only is wind power cheap and efficient, it's also nostalgic because it was used by our ancestors. And nostalgia seems to be sweeping the states these days. Railroad buffs from all over New York recently got together to ride a special train. It was the old Erie Lackawanna line, which has now been swallowed up by Conrail. Robert Miller of ABC News tells us why all the train buffs want to ride the Lackawanna. This is the Lackawanna Ramble, a nostalgic train ride arranged by the Jersey Central Railway Historical Society and NJ Transit. The Lackawanna doesn't really exist anymore. It was absorbed by Conrail about four years ago. The ride cost these people $18 each. Some of their colleagues spent hours reproducing the old Lackawanna insignias and things, just for today. One railroad buff I met is blind, but that didn't hamper his enjoyment. I get to ride the old equipment of the uh, various rail trips that I go on and sometimes get to touch everything and once in a while get to ride in a diesel or get to see just how the old equipment looked by uh, touching around on it when the crews permit me to do so. Who is the average railroad buff? Well, the average railroad buff is just about anybody that has a, uh, a fondness for railroads, whether it's a bank president or a railroad engineer or railroad conductor and their wives and their children. Everybody uh, kind of pauses when they hear the whistle blow at a road crossing. But railroads aren't doing too well. Well, it all depends. As far as 350 people are concerned today, the Lackawanna is doing fine. Robert Miller reporting for ABC News. Nostalgia is not only booming in the train business, it also means big bucks for antique cars. Classic models from the 50s and 60s are now in big demand by collectors and are bringing prices sometimes as high as three times the cost of the car when new. John North reports. They can't be called antiques or classics, but certain American cars of the 50s and 60s are bringing classic prices. The former family car has become a collectible, and for most dealers and restorers, business is booming. This unrestored 68 Mustang sells for $3,500. That's about what it brought new. Restored, the price could run as high as $12,000.
And at Beverly Hills Mustang, clients are willing to pay the price. In Beverly Hills in our area, surprisingly, I can get more heads turning with a 1965 GT convertible than I can with a 450 Mercedes. Far from Beverly Hills in San Dimas, Bob Wingate specializes in Chevrolets. A 1955 Chevrolet in good condition will sell for $3,000 more than its new car price. Add three to $4,000 if the car is a convertible. The main thing is the fact that uh, it's nostalgia. It's the charisma that that car had at that time, that date. It isn't just car crazy Southern California. These cars are being snapped up by buyers in the Midwest and East, where rust-free collectibles are rare. And the irony is that so many people were in such a hurry to get rid of these cars just a few years ago. They're worth more money now, they are appreciating, and the same people who sold them then are buying them now. John North, ABC News, San Dimas, California. Nostalgia doesn't have to stop with old cars and trains. It's only limited by your imagination. And so as long as there's dreamers who want something from the past, there'll always be men like Bud Asbutt, who will settle for nothing less than a full-sized Viking ship. Bud recently finished his replica, and his whole hometown set out to help him celebrate that accomplishment. Former AFNer Steve Sadal tells us more about this would-be Viking. It started as a dream for Bob Asp back in 1971, and it stayed a dream till December of 1973 when the first white oak trees were delivered to the new Wally Shipyard. The shipyard was formerly the Leslie Welzer potato cellar. Here, Asp spent thousands of hours building his ship, always with a multitude of onlookers. The front wall of the shipyard had to be removed to get the 74-and-a-half foot vessel out. It's modeled after a real Viking ship built about 850 A.D. There were more than 5,000 on hand for the christening ceremonies, including what some believe to be a real Viking, who calls himself Bearclaw, son of Bjorn. I'm hoping to get on the crew, yes. I'll be offering him my uh, sword arm, and hopefully he'll take me on. After speeches, dancing, and bands playing, it was time for the christening. Mrs. Asp's mother had the honors. Bob, how he felt being this close to fulfilling his dream. It's a great feeling to have all those people out there and, and talk to them, and we feel just kind of a unity. We feel all together, and I, I think that's a good feeling to feel, to feel together with the whole with the whole community. And the next step for Captain Bob Asp and his newly christened Coxstad Viking ship is the Duluth Superior Port Harbor, and from there, the ultimate dream to cross the Atlantic to go to Norway. Steve Siddall reporting for ABC News, Hawley, Minnesota. Almost as unbelievable as a Viking ship on the high seas is a four-year-old water skier. Little Pat McCormick has been water skiing since he was 11 months old and can do things on skis skiers three times his size wouldn't even try doing. Scott Lynn reports from Florida on this super ski. This is one of the best young water skiers in the world. He stands only 40 inches tall, weighs only 38 pounds, and is just four years old. His name is Patrick McCormick. He started skiing at the age of 11 months. Now at age four, he is able to do things on skis that most people only dream about. He is excellent at doing tricks. He can also slalom and jump off the ramp. But the most amazing thing is that Patrick can go barefoot. He is the youngest barefoot skier in the world. Patrick is never alone when he's out skiing. His faithful dog, Sheba, runs up and down the lakeshore, checking to see that his master is all right. The pup really has no reason to worry. This four-year-old boy can put on quite a show when he takes to the water. McCormick should be around water skiing circles for a long time. Patrick has many years of competition ahead. So does little brother Daniel. He's only two. From Sapner, Florida, this is Scott Lynn reporting. AFN Bramerhoven is known throughout northern Germany for the great high-budget horror movies it shows on Friday nights. With classics like Godzilla Returns and this Friday's Wonder Flick, The Petrified World, only the squeamish would dare turn off their television sets on Friday nights. 
Well, now, if you're squeamish, you should turn off your television set, because tonight on Spotlight, we have an even more terrible tale. It's the attack of the flies. What makes things even more chilling is this story is absolutely, positively, totally true. Bud Loda narrates the day the flies devoured Eagle, Idaho. And went back every time you do anything. <laughs> no matter what is done to try to kill them, Eagle has been taken over by the flies. Hitchcock himself couldn't ask for a better setting. The sleepy little town fallen victim to nature gone berserk. And no one knows why or what to do. Worst I ever seen. Sure is around here. Some say it's the proximity to a local slaughterhouse that brought them in. Others claim it's the chicken farm next door, or the mild weather perhaps. All agree that the area isn't fit for man nor beast. One almost has to have a cloth in her hand and brush the flies away in order to uh, get in without letting too many in. But there's always six, eight, or ten will get in every time you open the door. So we're always fly swatting flies. Sales of pest strips and all types of bug spray are at an all-time high, but most provide little relief from the hovering hordes. But residents are at their wits' end and will try anything. A friend was out Sunday and they said, well, go get you a bottle of a cheap hairspray and spray them, because that'll glue their wings and they can't fly, so... <laughs> Bob Loy for CBS News, Eagle, Idaho. And finally tonight on Spotlight, for those of you who hate reporting to anyone, because it means you must stand up and talk to someone who's sitting behind a big, impressive, intimidating desk. Well, after seeing this story by Larry Elston, you'll be glad the Army doesn't issue a desk like the one owned by a Florida Avon Lake air conditioning president. When you report to his office, you take the risk of being shot at, dive-bombed, or barrel-rolled. Hey, Kenny. Uh, Jackie, can you go ahead and bring my messages back to the day, please? 10 -4. There's no office intercom here. It's boss to secretary on a two-way radio. So Jackie Minnie is on her way down the hall to deliver the day's messages. Deliver them yeah. to the desk of Kenneth R. Long, a desk that's mm -hmm. one of a kind. Kenneth Long runs his Avon Park air conditioning business not only behind, but inside a one-seventh scale replica of a Sopwith Snipe, a World War I fighter plane that replaced the more famous Sopwith Camel. As long as a private pilot who spent six months and 1,000 hours building a very personalized desk. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Enjoy right. that as much as you do this Sopwith. I'm going to shoot you. Oh. Okay. It's the 1917 Sopwith Snipe uh, aircraft that I copied, and I went from a picture and uh, built it according to the picture. Uh, I took the faces out of real aircraft and put the dials in and everything. The throttle control works on it, the prop control works on it, the mixture control works, and the drawer opens up with a pull. It's a desk with all kinds of buttons and switches and cables and a two-way radio. The desk is made from oak and stainless steel. It doesn't really fly. But at the end of the day, when the clock on the prop says it's time to go home, you know that Kenneth Long wishes that it could fly. Clear. for CBS News, Avon Park, Florida. <laughs> what some people will do to act out their fantasies. Well, the weather forecast tomorrow is going to be beautiful, sunny and warm, 90 degrees with the sun shining the whole time, no chance of rain. That was my fantasy. Tomorrow it's going to be overcast and cloudy with the chance of rain showers. Same thing tonight, overcast and cloudy with a slight chance of rain showers, typical for Bramber Hobbit. Low tonight, 61 degrees. High tomorrow should be around 71 degrees. That's 22 degrees Celsius. Well, the dollar was lower in Frankfurt today, enough to change the military exchange rate, which goes down one fennec to one mark 75 for your dollar. That's one mark 75 tomorrow at all U.S. military banking facilities. That's a spotlight for tonight. Hope you enjoyed the program. I'm Specialist Jeff Titchener. Have yourself a pleasant evening.
television spotlight is compiled from major American networks and wire services, command information offices, the USAID news team, and the AFN staff. Spotlight is a production of AFN Television, Bramerhaven.